my computer. Okay, I'm recording. Okay, so um, I will one share the correct screen. Uh, I think it's this one. You see a Vim window there? Yep. Yes. Sweet. Um, so, uh, do we allow people that use anything other than Vim in this coding session? I've never seen, way, never seen anyone use anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's how we keep everybody away. <laughs> um, so we had this, um, a few, few weeks ago, we had a community, um, submitted MR to refactor some duplicate code in our training security training providers um, classes. Um, unfortunately, there was a bug with it where um, that didn't come to light until it got to production. Um, it wasn't covered by our tests. I subsequently added a test which actually picked it and we reverted the change and but during the during the analysis of it, I came across something very odd with the reactive caching code. Does anybody on the call know how to elevate a pitch reactive caching as we use it? Um, no, I was going to say I've never opened up the reactive caching concern. I have no idea what's in there. So I'm not entirely sure about everything that it does, but my understanding is that you can bring this concern into a what usually seems to be used in model objects, and um, you can perform an expensive operation um, in a background job that will eventually load. It will cache the result from that. Oh, that one. Mm. We had fun with that one yeah. last year. So, it, so it could, would you mind opening it, or do you want to just describe it? That's fine too. Whatever. No, that's, that's fine. Um, what can we find? Is that the one that uses Redis as well? Um, okay, so this is the concern here. Um, so basically you generally implement reactive cache key on a class or you can implement it, but I think this implementation here works for most rec active record objects. So usually this isn't overridden. And then you just have to, I think, yeah, you, you implement this method calculate reactive cache um i'll i think it's less important like what this is doing to actually than to just show the weird behavior we were getting so i'll just go ahead and try and do that okay so we have these um training provider Finders. Now they're not actually finders like most of our finders. They're not active record query builders. They are. They go to um, the websites of third-party um, folks who provide security training for different issues, and they and they come back. Those providers come back with a URL. So if you've got, you know, CVE one two three, you can say, "Give me a URL that will give me some training on that issue," and the training provider comes back with that URL. So that's the part that we cache is the call out to those providers. Um, so the weird part of this. Um, Sorry, I should have practiced this a little bit better before we started the call. Um, 
And what had been done in the MR to clean up was um, the author noticed basically that this this method here, reactive cache key, is this. We have three subclasses of this base class, um, so they all inherit from this, and they all have exactly the same method here, or it's a lambda, but they all have exactly the same implementation. Um, just look at another one. Um, what are they called? Um, that one. Okay, so this one you see, this is exactly the same. So they moved this into the base class. Then it only oh. cached one time? No, it blows up in a weird way. Hmm. Um, and so I'll just I'll just remove it from these two. I think the tests use this one actually, the contra finder. So I'll just and my problem is going to be remembering where the test is. <laughs> um. I think it's going to be this one. Oh, wow. Let's just have a look. Did I save everything? No. Loading, loading, loading. You're running this test. And it should pass, right? Because you have the non consolidated version of. Yeah, I just actually forgot to save that. So before I okay. ran it. So I think it, well, it might pass. It might not actually. Um, Burning as it, test. Uh, um, ah, starting <laughs> Gitterly. We oh, we'll just wait 50 seconds for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so essentially, let me find, might be helpful if I just find the, so what was interesting, we might even be able to see from this stack trace, is that, um, so we had this not implemented error. So that's basically uh, on the base <laughs> class. That method is set up on the base class so that if you don't implement it in a subclass, then you get this. Yeah. Which is a whole other story that I don't really like us using that, but there seems to be a kind of holy war going on about whether that's appropriate or not. Oh, anyway. like in the in the concern to put to uh, raise an error if it did. Yeah, it's just that it. not not implemented error is a Ruby is a Ruby exception that has a very 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 specific meaning. It's basically if you're using like virtualization or something and you and the instruction isn't implemented, then that's the error that gets raised. So it's not really made for being put in user code, but people do all the time. And uh, crucially, yeah. it's not a, it's not a child of standard error. Oh, so, so it's an exception. Expected. It's an exception yeah. rather than a standard yeah. error. Um, Maybe it should be a, a not overridden error. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. we, like personally, I just think no method error is fine. Like if, if you haven't got the method on your subclass, then just let it have a no method error. But I can see both sides of the argument. So anyway, um, 
but so what happens here is that this this piece blows up in an insure block in this class which we had open didn't we so I have I gone and closed it again? I think you might have. I did. Yeah. Are you going to go to five beef splits? Just go tab. This is the tab time. Tab time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is like when, this when, I, when it's, it's adding a little bit of a, a different vibe. Uh, I'll switch to a tab. <laughs> um. I'm fairly new to using FZF thing, so I'm still getting my head around it. But um, God sent. So uh, let me find where the error is happening. The error is happening here. One forty-five. Yeah. So we all know what insure does. Mm -hmm. Um. So basically, like if an exception happens in here, then this this code will run and it will run if an exception doesn't happen as well. So it's guaranteed to run. So when the code is in here and it has one of these, it's being called on one of these objects, one of these subclasses, the class that it references, let me just put into here. Let's um self dot class dot name. Um oh, it's in there. So when it runs in this when it's called here, it will put the subclass name. When it runs here, it gets the base class name. So it's executing in the context of the base class instead of the subclass. Now, I think that means, like what I'm not sure of, is that this code will, which is cancelling an exclusive lease, whatever that means, is not going to run with the correct cache key. Mm. Um. Uh, ah, well, it I seems keep... like it would be a problem. I feel like I feel like it's generally okay on most of our uses because we use it in active record model objects and we're not doing any kind of overrides of the methods that are being used in the concern. But the ah, let me see if I can get the test to run again. Uh, I might actually just. Um, inspect requests. GraphQL. Graph, GraphQL. API GraphQL. Uh, where were we? No. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Providers or something. It was something on training. Request training. Mm. Mutations. Is it mutation? No. Oh, the bottom one is API GraphQL muta uh, mutations. We here. opened a different one, I think. We did. Yeah. yeah. What have I? Is it an EE? I'm using EE. Oh, that's nice. EE spec. Requests. Request training providers. Security training URL spec. That's the one. Okay. Just try and leave that one open. And I'm hopeful that this is going to. Um, I'm really sorry I didn't get, have time to get this ready before. Cool. Could have um... Keep it casual. 
preparing for this. It's just us hanging out. <laughs> well, I don't think like watching me fumble around trying to remember how to reproduce something is not great. That's show. good. I, I I have a trouble locating GraphQL specs all the time, so it's <laughs> it's good to know I'm not the only one. Um, okay, so we're getting the right answer back the whole time at the moment. Um. Now, what is a method gone missing from here somewhere from the last time that I looked at it? I was in this one. Mm, that's weird. What's the method? Yeah. Um, I feel like there was a um, might be in MR. I feel like there was a refactor. Oh yeah, there's a MR in flight. I think that refactors some of this. So, what have I missed? That's been the spec passed right now, right? Did it? It did, which is weird ah, because it wasn't okay. doing it for me the other day. Um, assuming I'm running the right one, which I think I am. Yeah, it was reactive cache key. There was another method, wasn't there, that was duplicated. Worker finder. Be it. A worker finder. So you're removing that from the subclasses and it's just in the parent class. Yeah, just the one. And I'll just double check in the spec that it I think it's set up here. Yeah, it's set up here to use the Contra one. If it turns out I can't reproduce this right now, it's going to be very humiliating. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank goodness. Okay. Message. Oh, no. That's a different error. Finder full URL. Sorry. Uh, this is not the error that we had before. The error we had before was basically you know, this. Um, full reactive cache key. So you see how it was crashing out of base URL finder mm -hmm. in the full URL method. Um, just yeah, to step back a little bit. Sorry. Uh, so this error uh, you were getting after the uh, after drying up the modules, not uh... yeah. So it was after the changes that were in this MR. Yeah, that you have reverted right now in this MR. Um, so that what this one. Uh, oh, this is the revert. So, yeah. so we can see what I undid. Yes. yes. Opposite. Uh, in full URL is. Interesting. Oh, they removed full URL as raised, not implemented error. I'm like trying to reverse read this diff. Yeah, so sure. I go back. There. I can go back to the original MR and make the. Uh... <laughs> so the original Less MR brain magic. These issues. What was that? Sorry. Uh, the original MR. Uh, for the original MR, the specs were failing. No. Um, there was the... no spec. The, that spec that I've been running, I added after the original MR because we had no spec okay. that caught the error. Okay. So um, um, basically the, the GraphQL endpoint wasn't being tested in a request spec. It was just being tested in a unit test, which didn't okay. call the background workers. Um, so this one. 
So this was the original change. See, mm -hmm. these two methods were added to the... And they added full URL. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe you could add that. Yeah. Uh, to the base. So they added query string. Um, I wonder if there's an easy way for us to bring this back to life. Mm. Do you have the get MR? Oh, I guess it'd be hard because it's all like check out MR alias. I could check out, but it's two months ago, so I expect mm. that that might be different enough to just not work anymore. <laughs> I think uh, you can add the dot dot diff to the URL and you'll get just the diff. You can oh, apply. Yeah. Someone I was talking There's about something that about that week. I read lately. Um, to the to which to the part end of the URL, URL. yeah. Remove like diffs, here. maybe like to the end of that yeah. ID. Yeah. That and then dot diff. Really? I think so. Somebody just oh, showed okay. that. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> okay. If nothing all else, meeting today. Worth it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After people brought that up, somebody from the documentation team was like, is this documented? And it was just like silence. And it's like, this is our secret. So come on then, uh, <laughs> come on then, wizards. How would you uh, apply this? I would uh, put it geez. in a file and then yeah. and say get apply file name. Yeah, apply. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I, think I, yeah. I always so do it old like school. A... Oh, what do you do? Patch. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Showing my age, uh, I'm I'm going to do it without a wow. without an intermediary file and see ah, oh, see if oh. I can get it to work. Yeah. Hold on. What did I say? EOT. Mm -hmm. I think so. E or something. Wow. Ah, uh, failed. I failed. think it just oh no, it I, succeeded. Yeah, yeah, it skipped it. Wait, that's wait, it failed and then succeeded. What is that about? So oh. I think it kind of tries different levels of fuzziness. Uh -huh. I think should have tried it your way. Oh, and also, oh, I'd already modified it, hadn't I? Probably didn't help matters. It doubled some of what what you already did. Yeah, you know, did. but yeah, you could just do a git stash and then just run that command again. Unless the test is also not saved. Uh, the test was already way. added and committed, right? It was committed. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So git apply file name. Yeah, yeah should be. Yeah. Patch does not mm. apply. Why? Ah. Mm. Yeah. I think it's. I think it's probably changed outside of this. Um. Guess we'll stick to your method then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> seems like we'll see. Seems like it might, have, it. might have really messed things up. Okay, it's got rid of Stolas orange files. Get rid of. Hmm. Yeah, take care of those. Uh later, I guess. Yeah. I don't think it's yeah. Sorry. They're in the top level. Um. Okay, now where are we at? We're going to run our test within code applied so that you can see it fail in the way you expect. Oh. You might want to get rid of the double reactive cache key in the base class first. This is very true. Since it's applied twice, yeah. Those two, right? Yeah, those were doubled. Uh, yeah, that's right. 
Thank you so far. I thought it might be something weird with Ruby and the ensure block context. And I tried to just make like a little test case. Hmm. Here we go. I tried to make a little test case that just used Ruby classes and an ensure block to see if like I could recreate the same thing and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the not implemented error showing up. Yeah. So, um, and here's like, yeah, this is what I was seeing before, right? So we go, okay, it's contra URL finder, it's contra URL finder, and then it's base URL finder. Mm -hmm. But the object still has all of the properties that the contra URL finder had. So, um, I mean, maybe let's see, that's the query string method that's actually bombing out. So maybe if I pry into that in the base class, where's that gone? So it's on the bottom right yes. there. Very strange. Oh, no, this is wrong. Sorry. Query string. Well, it was in a call query string, so I think you should step into it. Well, yeah, do you prefer by bug to pry? Uh, a creature of habit, I suppose. <laughs> well, I don't I um I don't know if pry does it anymore, but it didn't used to be able to do like a step step debugging and hmm. going up and down the stack and Things yeah. like that, which I sometimes want to do. With. Does it do it now by default? It, uh, I believe that it does. I don't know. I was actually using Pry Shell today, which I had never used before. It was created by somebody at GitLab, and it allows you to pry in um, different pro So I was trying to open a pry in a worker because I couldn't figure out how to invoke this worker synchronously. It was like, you need a lot of really complex args. So binding.pry shell allows you to like connect that sh that pry session, um, which is cool, even if it's in the background process. Uh, but I was having, and it uses bybug by default. Um, but I was having, I was able to step into methods sometimes and then sometimes it was like not letting me get confused about whether I was in a pry session or not, so. Well, shout out to Mehmet, who's the author of that. I think he's on our team. Yeah, yeah, it's I pretty really cool. appreciate I have it. used it's it before. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I was literally googling around, being like, "How does one pry <laughs> into a non like into another process?" I was like, "Wait, we have this documented." And yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah the alternative would have been to start Sidekick uh, like synchronously in a in a session on your terminal, and then let it do that. Yeah, I was and trying that. I was having difficulty. The session. Yeah, yeah, but I was having a lot of. I mean, this is in the context of a much bigger debug where I feel like you know you start kind of just like being really messy and like you mess up yeah. things that you shouldn't mess up because you're just frustrated and so I probably shall yeah. listen. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> you can always okay. use the the proc file that GDK uses to start things as a cheat sheet. Oh, good idea. Okay, so we're in the pry, we're in the buy bug. So you can see the like the properties of our object here are all what we would expect on the subclass. The name of the provider is contra, et cetera, et cetera. That's weird because the name the yeah, the object ID has base finder in it. Yep. So the actual as far as Ruby's concerned at this point in time. Yeah, it's a it's a base URL finder. Now, when I've debugged this before, what is oh, what is it has contra in the name attribute though? Uh, it's possibly not the object actually. What what was happening? Um, 
is that I don't know if I can easily do this again here. Essentially, this at this point in the code, if you say self dot um, yeah. self dot class dot name, it gives you the correct mm -hmm. class name, and then at this point, I think it doesn't. Sure. So there's something specific to what insure does. It, yeah. Mm. Which I don't understand because. Seems like um, that would break a lot of things in Ruby. Yeah, and as as I say, I did just a vanilla Ruby class and a module and like the same sort of override setup, and it mm -hmm. didn't work. There is something from active support at play here, mm. which is a uh, class attribute, I think. Class attribute. Um, class attribute, right. So here, yeah. so I think this is perhaps... Yeah. Uh, why um, it's behaving a little bit differently. It's like on what class, depending on where this concern is being included. Yeah, I think class attribute is just kind of creates class mod, class method type behavior. Um, oh, yes, I was thinking of a class. Was it not an instance variable? Aren't, doesn't Ruby have class instance variables? It does. Um, at, at. It does. Those are like, um, I can't remember what um, Sam's expression was for where shared context came from the other week. In, um, like he wasn't a fan, but these are from the same place as that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they are. Yeah. Um, they're Especially basically, the <laughs> it's like a singleton variable that will be the same reference mm -hmm. in all classes and subclasses and sub subclasses. Okay. So if you if you touch it in one subclass somewhere, then it will impact all of the other classes that are in that inheritance tree. So it's really best never to use it. Um, Unless, like, that's the behavior you want, which you pretty much never do, I think. But anyway, this class attribute thing, declare a class level attribute whose value is inheritable by subclasses. Subclasses can change their own value and it will not impact the parent class. Basically gets rid of that hellhole. Yeah. Yeah. You can create class instance variables, so just regular at variables, but you can put them in a self dot whatever method, um, and they behave yeah, in the, cool. they be they behave like normal IVARs in the way. But I think they're not thread safe, um, I believe. So the they can create problems. I think that's correct. Don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, it can create. Anyway, getting off pace then. So, in theory, the, the class attribute should be can be overridden by children. Mm -hmm. By the child classes. By the child classes, but in this case, the issue. What and why do you think these are at play with this insure weirdness, insure block weirdness? Um, only because I couldn't reproduce it using like regular methods in. Now, it might be another factor, but I, like I tried to make a really simple test case with just a mm -hmm. module and, and a couple of and a class and a base class and a method that calls insure. And I just didn't see the same behavior. I guess the thing that maybe we could look at is um, what what's actually happening with these exclusive lease things. And is it a concern that we, um, because I think what's potentially happening is that we're not cancelling the right cache key in this call. In sometimes, potentially. <laughs> um, 
Does anybody know what this is, this class? I haven't looked at this yet. I think it's to make sure you don't. No other process can overwrite that while it's being used. That's when it starts the lease at the at the beginning of the method, and then it releases it at the end, uh, just to make sure nothing else is changing it at the same time. Right. I think I that's the gist of it. But uh, I have a I don't know the specifics. <clears throat> Has a timeout, so I guess um, that it's two minutes. <clears throat> Cash lifetimes ten minutes. So I guess it's probably safe in this case. If it if it wasn't cancelling the key anyway, it's going to hold the item in the cache for ten minutes if it's successful. Might mean you end up with the if it fails, you might end up having to wait two minutes. Yeah, yeah. If it if it reaches the insurer because of an error, then yeah. if the cache key is not properly being deleted or what is the verb uh canceled canceled i guess yeah the lease yeah it's probably to prevent uh a gridlock <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but then it wouldn't be doing that cancellation if it's not the correct cash key yeah it'll use a different key in the lease and then mm. a different one again in the yeah, they don't match up, and that sounds like it would be bad. Just to keep me honest, maybe we can just make sure that this is um, not insure. Yeah. And then... Um. The file has changed. Do I want to write it or not? Uh... No, no, probably, probably not. Just reload it and then paste that again. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I should have cut. That's it. Oh, I did. No, I didn't have it in the buffer. Is it still in reg? That's still what in the register uh do the colon register you should you might still see it like oh, come on teach me teach just, me just reg is enough but yeah there it is <laughs> and then uh you still see it in uh quote in double quote zero you can do double quote zero p and it'll paste that one or yeah. any of the other ones okay I intentionally put things into those named slots sometimes, but I don't know if do that. Yeah. Okay. So nice. uh, Just remove the, the knot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I've only, I've only known Rim, have been does that for like two weeks, and now it's, it feels like a new superpower. <laughs> I bet the amount of time I've been using Vim is really shocking how I've I've kind of learned how to walk and then I've not bothered to really learn anything else. And learn how to run after that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that a lot too. Um I, I love the the Vim tips exchange for that. That's feels like everyone has a, a shard of essential Vim knowledge and if we all combine it then <laughs> it works even better. Oh, look at that. <clears throat> so that said uh, not not insure. And it was base insure, URL. And it is so base. I'm actually telling you all lies. <laughs> so maybe, is it even gets the test set up? But you saw this in an error. No, I saw it in production. It was exactly the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but that's so, interesting. Is it because the those cache methods are defined? 
as class methods on the base class and then they don't propagate down. <laughs> that seems weird, but it feels like right, that's what's happening. Because the, the module, so they're, they're coming from the, um, the reactive caching concern. Yeah. Which is a module. Um, and that module is this included on the base, which is over here. Yeah. The 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 thing being that they it does work sometimes. Huh. This is <clears throat> Because what you would expect is we look at where the failure is happening. All reactive cache key. So the failure is actually coming out of the uh, wait. Uh, So we've got one plus line 147 on the stack, first of all, which is the, yeah, so the, the stack doesn't. It's in the insure block, right? And then it's, it's... In the insure block. Yeah. So maybe when it it's is... trying to cancel it's trying to get the full reactive cache key i think that's where that stack trace leads right uh, so, so, the, ex so it's probably failing here too but but that uh, because the insure blocks there then it we lose yeah. that from the stack trace i think so you could try to rescue uh and then pry well, back maybe, into it maybe if i just like you could Maybe or, if I just that. remove that. Or you could comment that out, yeah. That would have the same effect, probably. And then if we get the um, exception from... <laughs> then it should, what? yeah. Line 1 or 2. Might be happening there as well. Okay, so I think maybe that's, yeah, that would explain my confusion. Oh, should have got rid of those spy bugs. Mm. So. One, four, two. Four, two. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, and yeah, I was getting... going into full reactive cache key again, yeah. Yeah, so I was getting confused because we lose the, that from the stack trace when the insure block's there. It was masking the other air. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's pretty helpful, actually, because the thing that I was worried about was those leases not cancelling. So I think that they'll be failing to be created anyway. Because the error was when it was trying to create them. Yeah. 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 So, and and that's actually been. It doesn't feel like much progress, but that's a big, a big gain for me now that I know that that's happening. Okay. Write um, it down before it, you forget it. Dig into it I guess we just record it. This is recorded, <laughs> so you can just rewatch this. That's the worst when you have realization. And then yeah, I I think we probably don't need to. Um, dig any further on this then it's not as weird an error as i thought it was um i thought it was switching it's a, class it's a context good between those yeah. two um so all right Great. i'm gonna stop share there yeah thanks folks thank you Very i well. guess did anyone else add anything oh i added my one on emojis but i don't know how much progress we get i feel the good thing is that are like the nice thing about going through that is that you were looking into kind of like weirdness with rescues and that, that's exactly the kind of bug that I've been working with is uh 
like it feels like something's being rescued somewhere that shouldn't be like things are silently failing which is the scariest type of failure so well i'll tell you what we can do we can do a straw poll about this not implemented error thing okay great <laughs> <laughs> So there is actually a there's an issue talking about it somewhere. Okay. Um, uh, and it's one of those kind of hugely bike sheddy discussions. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just I found it by Google. Yeah, same here. Discourage usage of not implemented error. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was created a year ago by another member of my team. Yeah. Seem to be in all of the wrong places, don't we? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, seem like anyone is unhappy with this, just no one's doing it. I think the argue there there was interesting thing where somebody had said, look, if you look at all of Ruby gems, it's all over, it's throughout Ruby code, out in the wild, everywhere. Like people just use. Um, yes, and and I truthfully, before you mentioned it today, I didn't realize that um, the the reason for not using it because I too have seen that pattern a ton and always thought it was a good way of, or like, it just seemed to be the default way of ensuring that when you're using inheritance, you're implementing the interface that you expect. Yeah. And it's interesting. So if you look at the top there, like uh, rationale item one is like, um, this exception is for if you don't implement things like fork, if the platform that you're running on doesn't implement a, an instruction or something very very low level there is clearly not like if you can't if you want to fork and you can't fork there's no way to carry on or you're trying to allocate memory that kind of thing is unrescuable whereas this is rescuable mm -hmm. like in a lot of cases you could quite easily you might be running through a thousand objects doing a report or something and one of them doesn't work the way you expect you could rescue that and say mm -hmm. oh, i had one error during execution so yeah i wonder how many and how many instances of not implemented error do we have in the GitLab code base quite a few yeah maybe i mean oh wow, 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 wow. although it'd be a relatively easy one to just change right like uh, ooh, i guess just trying to use the easy word but um swapping it for something standard doesn't seem yeah. too hard so no method error um it, it would make sense to me if no method error wasn't used all over the place for um it yeah, either that or it's just a standard error with a message that yep. must be overridden. Almost feels like that's almost enough. I mean, I, I'm of the opinion, I don't know if it's a very popular one, that you just don't implement anything on the base class. And then if somebody tries to call that method on one of your subclasses, then you just get a no method error. Because that's no extra code. And... I think we should do it. Maybe as a group, we can band together and make this happen. I think <laughs> it seems like no one's really, it doesn't seem like the argument against, it doesn't seem like the against people are that passionate about against. They're kind of just like, meh, it doesn't bother me. But that's yeah, true. I think yeah. I think that's interesting. I think like I, I guess probably for me fundamentally intentionally raising an exception rather than a standard error is something we should probably not be doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um 
but again, it's one of those things. It is it is everywhere. It is used by a lot of gems. It's but that doesn't necessarily mean we need to add to the pile. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's just, it is helpful. Like, I really love the way at GitLab we use RuboCop to, when when it's used to enforce things that actually, like, you always want to do. Like, sometimes it's annoying because you have to say, oh, I don't, actually don't want to do that in this situation. But this seems like a case where anytime somebody got this RuboCop error, they would just change it. And they wouldn't be like, no, I need, you know, I need to rescue non-implemented error. I need to raise an implemented error. Seems like that would never happen. Um, that has happened to me today. We talked about this, I think almost, was it last week about people misspelling aggregate failures or doing <laughs> aggregated failure. I did today. I did that. I, I added aggregate errors like three times in the RuboCop raised before I could commit because that doesn't do anything. <laughs> I was like, thank you. So, um, I think this would be great. I'm not very good at writing RuboCop rules. Um, but this one seems like it wouldn't be that bad. It's a string match. Yeah. So do you think that we would just have a different exception, like our own custom exception that's... Yeah. That's actually a standard error. I think, I think that's I, one of the proposed solutions. I think create, no our own, create our oh, own exception class. Our own exception Option class. Option two yeah. right at the top. Option two, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is Ruby issue tracking system? It's like bug filler for Ruby. Yeah. Um, Ask Ruby to create this great access. Ah, oh, interesting. You could see I bet somebody's raised this issue on Ruby. Well. Look, we could be core contributors if we do this. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, what will the uh, uh, own exception class will do? What that no method is not doing. Um, the the main thing would be that it doesn't that it inherits from standard error. Mm -hmm. Because not implemented error does not inherit from standard error. That's right. Okay. So that means that technically you're not supposed to rescue it. Understood. Yeah, I, I assume most, I don't know if we have a RuboCop rule for this, but usually people say, like, do not just call rescue, always call rescue standard error. Yeah. Um, so if not implemented error reached here, it would not, in fact, be rescued. Um, it would just raise, which in a way you kind of wanted to actually, like maybe I can do the straw man or like the argument, I don't know if it's a straw man, but like the argument against the- Devil's advocate. Yeah, devil advocate, exactly. Like, I guess when I've used this pattern in the past, the intention is that it would never- reach an end user it's like a it's almost like just a tip to developers and so you really kind of want to throw the error in their face because you're like this is an error you cannot rescue it like you have to override this method is how i've used it in the past but um i understand that uh, there are situations where those kinds of things sneak through to end users yeah I don't know if you look at if you look at the class of errors that are in that group, they are mm -hmm. literally things like out of memory. Like yeah. there is literally no way you can carry on executing if you're out of memory. It's done. You're over. Finished. Yeah, yeah. This like not not having a method available is not on that kind of spectrum mm -hmm. of errors. You know, it's mm -hmm. there are a number of situations where you could rescue that and carry on. Yeah, and to to bring it to a meta level, that I mean, you already kind of touched on it, Malcolm. But like, why why do we need to even raise that there? I mean, that's uh, on a base class. Uh, you could either have an empty method, and then the spec should show that you're doing something wrong, or you just don't care that it's a no op. Uh, why does it need to be a hard hard hit like that? Like, the only reason it it's useful is because we have some form of coverage specs that'll make sure every path gets hit and then 
through that, it'll hit the not implemented error currently. But in another sense, you should have probably have the unit specs anyway that are going to ensure that whatever you're calling on that, whatever you're subclassing is doing something useful. So it seems like uh, a safety net that's not really needed. Uh, seems weird. Yeah. I think the other thing for me is using that pattern of the, you know, the error method in the base class. It kind of moves the stack trace to a potentially less, like if you do error out, you end up erroring out from the base class rather than from mm. the caller. Yeah. Which might make more sense if it errors out in the caller of that method. It's like, okay, I see where this happened. I don't know. It's. I mean, it's, there, it's sort of there to try to enforce an interface. It, and, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, one day maybe we'll get that in Ruby, like built in. Mm. But not today. Not today. Maybe we should just, uh, I don't know. Must imp make a must implement class methods, and then it looks if methods defined are there or not. <laughs> Uninitialized. Yeah, why not? <laughs> if, it can't, if it can't do it, then it yeah, we're missing something. Uh, uh, it's more explicit that way. Uh, why why you're doing it? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. Good ideas. Thanks, everyone. Um, all right, we're on time. Week. Yeah. All Go. right. Thanks, Bye. folks. Have a good one. See Bye. You later.